Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Antonio Gracias uh, with Valerie Partners. And um, I'm here because we invest in mission-driven companies with great founders like Keller Yandu from, uh, from Zipline. And we also invest in artificial intelligence. And Keller's company is, uh, at its core, an artificial intelligence-driven company. So before we start, why don't I just ask Keller to introduce himself and talk about Zipline a little bit. Keller? Okay. okay, how about this? Great. Um, yeah, Zipline uh, uh, operates the largest commercial autonomous system on Earth. We use autonomous aircraft to deliver a wide variety of healthcare products, uh, uh, food, as well as quick commerce products across eight countries. We just crossed 65 million commercial autonomous miles. This year we'll deliver 13 million doses of vaccine, 2 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine, we deliver 75% of the national blood supply of two different countries fully autonomously uh, using aircraft that um, the, the company designs, manufactures, and operates at scale. So that's what we do. So, uh, I'm, is this thing on now? Yeah, okay. So I said earlier we invest in, in mission-driven companies with great founders. Well, I think this may be, it is one of the most mission-driven companies we've ever invested in because Zipline is fundamentally at its beginning, in its core, saving lives in Africa. And we have a video, actually. I, I had the chance to visit uh, Rwanda, I told a story, with my daughter to see our distribution facility in Rwanda. And in Rwanda, they have a sort of a three-tier healthcare system. It is hospitals, clinics, and then midwives in the field. And we saw uh, zip lines, zip, zips, flying off the distribution centers, going out to deliver blood and drugs or other products to midwives in the field, to the outlying areas. And it, it was shocking to me. It, it literally brought me to tears that uh, Zipline has reduced the maternal mortality rate, this is from uh, bleeding, by 88% in the country. So women that were dying by having babies out in the middle of nowhere in, in Rwanda, we've literally reduced that rate by 88%. So let's cue the video so we'll see what it's about. Yeah. And I'm just so grateful that you've done this, Keller. Thank you. Yeah, I think, look, a picture's worth a thousand words. So um, this video was actually just shot just a couple days ago. And if you notice in, in the corner above me, um, this video starts at midnight because we operate 24-7, 365. So you're seeing, you saw flight operations, now you're seeing fulfillment operations. Um, this is of Rwanda 1, the distribution center uh, that Antonio visited. This is now Rwanda 2, you can actually see the sunrise. Uh, again, you can see flight operations, aircraft taking, in, taking off those launchers. This is fulfillment operations, but the real reason we're showing this video is you're about to see the map. And when you see the map, you'll see all of these aircraft out making deliveries live. So you can see that it's only, what, like 7 a.m. We've already delivered 2,000 products. Every one of these aircraft out making deliveries is flying itself fully autonomously. So people think of drone delivery as like vaporware or not real. Um, it is, you know, in a country like Rwanda, it's completely normal. We're operating at national scale, day in and day out, delivering a wide variety of life-saving medical products to every hospital and health facility in the country. We started with just blood, we've now expanded to uh, uh, animal health care, artificial insemination for cattle, childhood malnutrition, uh, e-commerce products. Uh, the country is now building a new national postal service. They're doing that on top of Zipline's platform. So you'll see there are often 35, 40, 50 aircraft out making deliveries all at the same time. Uh, if we're getting into the afternoon, you know, we've now delivered almost 4,000 products. This is, a, this is a logistics system that serves all people equally. It's a logistics system that's 10 times as fast as what we think of as instant delivery today. It's half the cost. It doesn't depend on pre-existing infrastructure. We can get to any, any location we need to get to. And it's also a way of transitioning all logistics to zero emission globally. And so th this is the, um, an amazing story, right? How does, how does uh, Keller, who grows up in the US, um, you know, goes to college at Harvard, end up in Africa building an enabled uh, drone company? How does it actually happen, Keller? Yeah, I mean, you know, we started building the company in 2013, and it, it did. Our backgrounds were in uh, robotics and automation and software. Our, it seemed to us that someone was going to build a, an automated logistics system for Earth. And when we thought about this opportunity to build a new kind of logistics system, what you know, what got us excited from a mission perspective was this realization that logistics really only does a good job of serving the golden billion people. If you're in the seven billion who are not included in that group, your access to logistics either sucks or it's non-existent. 
And as a result of that, five and a half million kids lose their lives every year due to lack of access to basic medical products. And we've been pretending for a hundred years like that's somehow acceptable or unavoidable. And we just felt like it was not either of those things. So if, if we were gonna build a new kind of logistics system, we wanted to build the first logistics system that would serve all humans equally. Uh, we knew when we were launching this, we really needed two things. One, we needed a country that would give us regulatory permission quickly. We also wanted to work with a public health care system. So that immediately ruled out the United States. Um, and so we ended up spending a lot of time in East Africa and President Kagame and the Minister of Health at the time. I remember meeting the Minister of Health of Rwanda and telling her, you know, we wanted to use autonomous aircraft to deliver medical products to all the hospitals. She was like, Keller, shut up, just do blood. And so for the first year, that's actually all we did. We delivered blood to 21 different hospitals. Um, and it's been, yeah, it's been an amazing partnership from there. You know, seven years in, Rwanda now has the largest commercial autonomous system on earth. We've expanded to eight other countries, including the United States, Japan, soon to be Australia and the UK. Um, and Zipline just crossed 65 million commercial autonomous miles, which to put into perspective, you know, people think of Waymo as a big autonomy company. Waymo has done about a million commercial autonomous miles. That's amazing, Keller. And I, I'm just curious one level deeper. So you could have done anything, literally anything. Why this mission? I mean, why, why take the pain to go to Africa? Like, what really drove you uh, intellectually and emotionally to do this? I mean, I think that, you know, to me, uh, the most exciting companies in the world are the ones with the most inspiring missions. And you've invested, you know, you made your career investing in some of the most inspiring mission-driven companies on Earth, like Tesla and SpaceX. And, you know, th those are companies that deeply influenced and inspired us. And, you know, life is short and you have like one chance to do something that matters. And so to us, like when we look at the world, we feel like so many technology companies in the U.S. are focused on solving what are fundamentally rich white people problems. Like they are focused on rich customers who live on the coast of this single country. And when you think about what it's going to take to move, move humanity forward to create like the world that we w would be proud to hand to our kids, we need, like, all of these problems that impact 6 billion, 7 billion people on Earth that, that we need to be solving, there's this attitude of, like, well, the Gates Foundation will do that. USAID will solve that problem. And what I can say is, like, they definitely won't. The only way we're going to solve those problems is with technology and with mission-driven, for-profit companies that have, like, uh, you know, working and sustainable unit economics that can actually scale to provide a service to many billions of people. And... So it really always seemed to us like we have got to get the smartest engineers working on problems that matter at humanity's scale. And we, and we want to be able to show that you can raise a lot of money from private companies to build technology for you know, the, the 7 billion humans on, or the 8 billion, not just the, the, the golden billion. Yes, I, I will tell you, um, standing in Rwanda at the Dishon Center and then seeing the, the package delivered to the hospitals was among the most inspiring things I've done in business. It was an extraordinary experience for, for me and my daughter. So I want to I thank you. Still pretty exciting to me, too, when I get to go see it. Man. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, I feel privileged to be here with you. Thank you. Um, you know, we also, part of this is investing in artificial intelligence. And our strategy at Valor is to invest in what we call verticalized artificial intelligence. This is companies that can build uh, data modes around usually verticalized software applications and, and then hardware. And you've done an amazing job of this. Could you uh, describe this to us? Describe the system of artificial intelligence, how it integrates with the, with, with the hardware, and how it all works, please. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, a lot of times people look at Zipline, they get really excited about the drone. They get really excited about an aircraft. And I think the thing to emphasize is that none of our customers care about drones or aircraft at all. Like, all they are buying is teleportation. Our customers want to be able to buy a service that ensures that they can deliver a product from point A to point B so fast that it saves a human life or it creates, like, a, a, a massive economic advantage for that customer. And... Uh, all of the technology that needs to sit behind the curtain in order to make that sort of a thing possible, we have to be ultra full stack, and we're you know very 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 inspired by Tesla on this front. I mean, Zipline, you know, our electrical engineering team is building the flight computers and all of the avionics from scratch. Our firmware team is writing all the low level code that that powers that avionics. Our uh, mechanical engineering team is designing all of the different 43 sub assemblies and 2,000 parts that then get you know sent out to hundreds of global suppliers all over the world. Our software team is doing everything from writing flight control algorithms to doing computer vision-based pre-flight checks to neural nets and computer vision uh, uh, for route planning, 
multi-vehicle deconfliction. Uh, we build unmanned traffic management systems that our regulators use to actually monitor the air, air, airspace, and then everything to customer applications. So, so everything I mentioned there is really powered by everything from machine learning to computer vision to neural nets. Uh, Zipline, uh, about six weeks ago, became the first company in US history to be awarded approval by the FAA to fly beyond visual line of sight at national scale throughout the US. And that was, that was enabled by a detect and avoid technology that we built that uses passive acoustic sensors combined with a neural net um, that just would not have been possible without a lot of the advances of AI over the, over the last five years. So it's really like, yeah, infused into everything we do and enables like a hardware and software solution that ultimately we want to create this product experience for our customers where they don't have to know anything about the technology. It just feels like teleportation. You, you built an amazing data mode and interestingly, a regulatory mode in some ways, right? So uh, my understanding is the, the US government is now learning from Rwanda to, to build our, our American um, regulatory system for autonomous flight. Can you tell us how that's been, watching the US government learn from Rwanda? Yeah, I mean, it's very funny, obviously. I mean, because we, I mean, we spent five years working with the FAA to get this regulatory approval. And, uh, you know, the, the reason that Zipline became the first company to get that approval is that we now have 65 million commercial autonomous miles, which is about 50 times more than all the other players in the space combined. And so 65 million commercial autonomous miles, zero human safety incidents is pretty much what it took to kind of get the FAA over the line in, in terms of concluding that this was safe enough to, to, um, to certify in the US. And certainly, you know, we were inviting them. We were like, don't guess, just come and visit, come and see it, you know, go to one of these seven other countries where we're operating at scale. So actually the FAA did fly a big team of their technical experts to Rwanda, you know, this tiny country that, um, you know, has a GDP that's very different than the U.S., for example. And the FAA was in uh, the, the RCAA, which is their counterparts in Rwanda. And I remember this, this profound moment where the FAA was like, sort of confused and asked the question twice. And the RCA was getting sort of frustrated trying to explain to these idiots like how the system works. And, uh, and someone at the RCA has just finally said, you guys are dinosaurs. <laughs> you need to get with it, you know? And, and it's, it's quite powerful to see like this small like entrepreneurial country just really kicking ass and like setting the standard like that. You know, I, I think we as American citizens, or I as an American citizen, I think we have this sort of sense of entitlement or this, um, you know, we're confu we, we think that, oh, we're always going to lead in terms of innovation. And it's just not true. Like, actually, small, innovative countries investing and in using AI and autonomy to save lives, they are, like, leading the world, and they are becoming the role models. And really, my hope is that the U.S. will be a fast follower. Look, I think that's why we're here, right, to bring innovation to the region. Um, I love, I wish I was, I'd been a fly on the wall with a, with a little video camera of the, of the meeting with FAA and the, Rwanda, the U.S. FAA and the Rwanda. That's quite funny. Uh, so part of our investment framework is also disrupting on product and cost, getting things cheaper over time, which I know you believe in, uh, particularly from the, sort of the, the Tesla um, example you're following. And we have product uh, 1.0 now in the field, right? The 1.0 zip, we're going to 2.0. Um, why don't we roll a video of 2.0 and then you can talk about that. Yeah, sure, that'd be cool. Um, so the, you know, the, the next generation product that we announced a few months ago is really designed to, and if we could, if we could play the second video, um, is really designed, it's, it's just to enable home delivery. So we want to enable teleportation from any hospital, any warehouse, any store, any restaurant, directly to the home. So here you can actually see an order being placed. The, the zip docks. Uh, it lowers what we call a droid. Uh, a Walmart employee, Cleveland Clinic employee, Mayo Clinic employee can load whatever they need to load into the droid. You can like train someone to do this in two minutes. There's literally no expertise required. Uh, the droid is then pulled back up into the vehicle, and the vehicle uh, takes off and will fly directly to uh, the location, the GPS coordinates of the home that we're delivering to. Uh, once we arrive there, the vehicle can hover, and then we lower the droid, and the droid is actually actively controlling its position on the X and Y axis. This means that we can deliver silently with dinner plate level accuracy. So this will work for 99% of homes in the US. This really gives you like an instant delivery experience that is 10 times as fast as something like DoorDash or GoPuff. It's about half the cost. It's fully zero emission. And by the way, you know, it, it, we, we, um, we can typically, when we're working with a partner, like 10x the number of customers who are reachable from any hospital or warehouse or store. So we think it's pretty obvious it's the future. Like when you look at you know, the US market, 
just the US market, there'll be four and a half billion instant deliveries done this year. And we're using a 4,000 pound gas combustion vehicle driven by humans to deliver something to your house that weighs five pounds. Like this is definitely insane if you spend a second to think about it. And uh, it's just inevitable that these systems, like we shouldn't be using technology that's 100 years old. We should be using technology that's designed to solve this problem in a way that's good for customers and good for the environment. And so we think there's gonna be a huge transformation in logistics over the next couple of years. So uh, let, let's zoom out a little bit, Keller. Um, you know, I, we believe at Valor that mission-driven companies actually succeed and deliver great returns because you attract great people. You've done this, not just in the US, but globally. I mean, I was super impressed with the team I met in Rwanda. Um, how has that been? Tell us about the experience of trying to track people globally on this mission and building these teams all around the world. I mean, I think the way we think about it is that, like, as a startup, there's, you, we, we, we can never compete with Facebook and Google and these companies that will pay, like, outrageous salaries, right, and outrageous stock options. Um, but to succeed, like, we have to hire the best people on earth. And the good news is, I think, especially for the next generation, like, the generation of engineers and elite operators who are graduating from the best schools in the world, um, these people want to work on things that matter. They want to build a version of the world that they would be proud to hand to their kids. They want to be able to say you know, to their grandkids, like, look at this legendary thing that you now take for granted. I built that, and I was there like, at the very, very beginning. Um, I think people want to be a part of something legendary, and um, yeah, that's been our, it's been our secret weapon. The reality is people have been so willing to kill themselves, like working long hours, I mean, you know, Launching in Africa, especially for the first few years, there's like constant sleepless nights, constant 30-hour flights back and forth, coach class. Um, but I think the mission of the company, I think companies that try to like use money as the rocket fuel are never really going to succeed. Like for Zipline, if you think of us, like the company as a rocket, like the mission is the rocket fuel. And then like me and the other leaders were like the tiny little thrusters at the top of the rocket that are adjusting our trajectory by you know, like a tenth of a degree here or there um, in order to make sure we get to where we need to go. So, um, you know, you know this, but the thing that really motivated us to come meet you was uh, how many wonderful, talented executives from Tesla you hired. who were super mission-driven people who were, were, were not motivated by money at all. It was like number three or four on the list. It was about mission. And yeah, you've attracted an ex extraordinary set of executives. Um, I'm really impressed with it. It's amazing. So again, zooming out a little bit, uh, tell us about the the kind of the product roadmap, the commercial roadmap, where are we, if you could share, in the US with our commercial strategy, and where do you see the company in sort of one, three, five years? Yeah, I mean, so next year, we're launching this next generation product with partners, not just like the government, government of Rwanda, but we're also uh, working with Walmart, uh, Intermountain Healthcare, MultiCare, Hamilton Health, Michigan Medicine, uh, we have a big announcement coming out tomorrow. Uh, I, I mean, really, like all of the biggest healthcare systems in the US are actually signing large scale enterprise contracts to transition all of their home delivery to Zipline, which is just, you know, pretty mind blowing. I thought it would take longer than that. So, uh, you know, healthcare is a huge portion of what we're doing, quick commerce with partners like Walmart and GNC, another part. And then we're just beginning with food with partners like Sweetgreen. So, scaling nationally, uh, you know, we think that. This kind of a service, I, I do think it's like inevitable that one of the most valuable companies on Earth is going to build an automated logistics system for Earth. I think that company will be bigger than FedEx and UPS and possibly Amazon combined. Um, and again, like for us, like what really what really motivates us on that front, and, and you know, it's not just the U.S. Like we're continuing to scale. I mean, really every country should have access to this technology. Our goal is to build a logistics system that serves all people equally. And so, uh, you know, the good news about Technology and automation is that by reducing costs, by building technology that's better for the environment, it can actually scale far, far faster than systems that rely on like super heavy gas combustion vehicles and labor. Like in the US, for example, there is not enough labor to scale logistics systems right now. Like UPS and FedEx cannot hire enough drivers. So I think we often have this idea of like, oh, automation, like it's gonna, you know, cause us to, it's, it's going to eliminate jobs. The reality is it's actually just gonna allow the economy to grow vastly much faster. So we are in the, um, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Thank you very much for the invitation. We're happy to be here. Uh, and it, all, it obviously begs the question of, uh, what is your strategy for the region, Keller? How do you think about the Middle East? And how are you thinking about the, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Well, look, like the funny thing is, and like in many ways, we're sort of like stealing the vision of so many of the 
countries in this region that are dreaming big about building not the infrastructure of the 19th century, but building the infrastructure of the 21st century. You know, so we look at projects, whether it's like you know, the Jordanian government um, using technology to serve refugee camps, to using technology to serve veterans hospitals. There's like huge opportunity. Um, and by the way, also struggling deeply with things like traffic in capital cities. We look at Neom, you know, the line. You look at the 3D renderings from any, for any of these mega projects, uh, drone delivery features prominently in them. So to a certain degree, we feel like we're just enabling the vision that a lot of the countries here already have. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that, you know, there's always this, I, like, do you want to build, you know, do you want to build the uh, infrastructure of the past or should you skate to where the puck is going and build the infrastructure of the future? And I think that generally what we found and, and our finding as we talk to partners in the Middle East is that, and particularly in Saudi Arabia, is that there's just like such an appetite to like dream about the future, build the science fiction version of the future that we would be proud to hand to our kids, transition logistics towards zero emission. Um, yeah, you know, just, I, I, I think that you know, we're just very aligned and, uh, and excited to enable that vision however we can. Well, thank you, Kelly. I think we're out of time, but um, it's great to be here with you. I appreciate it very much. And great to be with Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Thanks, Antonio.